Good morning. It's uh, good to see everybody here this morning. We have a, a thin crowd. I know that there's been a lot of people out of town and some who have had uh, allergies and issues like that. Isn't it crazy? Right in the middle of summer, we get allergies. But uh, it just so happens that's the case. Amanda's been kind of battling some allergy things and she's been doing really great this week. But she decided to go ahead and stay home one more weekend just to be safe, but uh, everybody's doing good and uh, we're just uh, enjoying the warm weather. How about you guys? Is it warm enough for you? <laughs> yes, thank you. But uh, we're very grateful that you're here. It's always good to be here. It's encouraging uh, to be here and to be able to worship our Heavenly Father and just really spend some time together encouraging one another. And so as we enter into this uh, worship service this morning, let's let's clear our minds of any of our worldly cares, and let's really focus on, on worshiping Him and glorifying Him. Do well. We read from Psalms 19, verses 9 through 10. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Let's sing. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You're my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You're my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. When the dark powers had done their worst, Jesus brought victory o'er their curse. 
He is our all in all. They could not hold the King of Kings. Now to his heirs new life he brings. He is our all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worthy is your Father, we thank you for your son that you chose to forgive us of our sins, that he spilled his blood upon the cross. Heavenly Father, we want to bless everyone that's in attendance today, just be at them and uh, just be at the Cobo family at this time as they are in grief of losing their wonderful and beautiful pot. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for all things. And we watch ones that are watching on the television, just be with them too as they all. Just be with the ones that are sick and sad at heart this time. Be with the ones that are lost that they may find the avenue of prayer and that, uh, <coughs> of faith and they might be saved. Heavenly Father, we just want to be at this nation this time that we so much stuff going on that we just have the rancor and all the hatred and all the family. Just put a calming hand over this and that you can calm it down. This is the way life is, the Heavenly Father. We just know that there will be people that are always backstabbing other people who want be it the leaders of this government that they might govern a way that benefit all people instead of just a few. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the military people, the peace police people, the first responders and all that do their thing. That keep this country safe. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. In a few moments we'll be doing the memorial to our Heavenly Father that died upon the cross, that Jesus, that he spilled his blood. And let's be ever mindful of the reason we do it and do it in the manner of what please. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full, hearts full of praise, so be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full. Hearts full of praise, so oh, be exalted, O oh, Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. 
How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone, I've been set free My God, my Savior, has ransomed me And like a flood, His mercy raised Unending love Amazing grace Through many dangers, tolls, and snares I have already come Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far And grace will lead me home When we've been there Ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to see God's praise than when we first begun. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. It is time for us to gather at this Feast of Remembrance. And uh, we ask you to stop and to consider removing all earthly things from your heart as we participate in this Feast of uh, Remembrance. Does everyone have your communion? If you will get it out and be prepared, we will uh, start our communion. First of all, I would like to read to you from 1 John 4. And it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son is an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you'll bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, how glorious is your name. You are the creator of the world. You're the giver of life. You give us everything that we have. Father, we're so thankful that you loved us enough that you were willing to sacrifice your son on the cross, that through him we might know you and have everlasting life. Father, we ask you to bless this bread which represents Christ's body. We ask you to help us to remember the sacrifice he paid. 
Father, we ask you to help us to honor and glorify him. Help us to take it in a way that will be pleasing to you and will bring honor and glory to your name. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Will you bow with me again? Our Father in heaven, once again, we approach your throne. Father, we ask you to bless this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's shed blood on the cross. He was without sin, but he was willing to be the sacrifice to pay the debt and wash away all of our sins. Father, we know you through your son, Jesus. Help us to honor him in this feast of remembrance. Father, we thank you for everything that you have given us. But most of all, we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we wholly pray. Amen. This ends our communion service and our Feast of Remembrance. Uh, there is a box at the back if you've come prepared to make a contribution for the work of this congregation. Just remember that it is with a cheerful heart that we give to this work. And now we'll go on. Thank you. If you're able to, I'll ask you to please stand for the, for the song for the sermon. We'll sing, We Bow Down. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all lords, you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life, king of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. I was trying to operate this thing from over there, and apparently it's uh, just right out of range. Sorry about that. It worked right there and not over there, so I don't know what's up with that. Well, it sure is good to see everybody this morning, and uh, we're, we're going to continue our study series on temptation. We've been looking at Jesus and his uh, temptation in the wilderness. And so we're going we're gonna to continue looking at that, but we're going we're gonna to kind of take a little bit of a, um, um, a side turn as we continue this idea of these desires of the flesh, and, uh, which was what we talked about last week. And so there's several things that we can consider in regards to what the body desires and uh, what, what God desires. You know, what kind of wisdom comes from, from us and what kind of wisdom comes from above. 
And there's a lot of things that we can really insert in it. In fact, I was really thinking that, man, we can spend a whole you know, quarter on that, just talking about all the different things that you know, the body desires, and, and God says, you know, that's it's not a great idea. You know, and we really need to listen to God and, and really pay attention to what he's trying to communicate to us for our own good. So this morning, as we're going to begin this lesson, I, I found some, uh, some tweets uh, from some Bible characters. I found them online, so I'm sure that they're, they're accurate. And you know, five years ago, I felt I would have felt like I needed to explain what a tweet is, but I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. If you ever watch the news, you figure that out. So here are a few of them that I thought would be funny for us to look at as we start this, um, start this service this morning. This one's from King David. <clears throat> Done fighting lions and Philistines, taking a safer job, playing my harp with the king. Hashtag can't lose. I'm sure that was a fun experience for him. The next one is from Balaam. He says, uh, he tweets, for starters, booting all talking animal movies from my Netflix clue, uh, queue. Hashtag been there, done that. Um, I, I don't even know if Netflix has a queue anymore. I haven't really been paying attention to that. That might be too old school for us anyway. Jeremiah. <clears throat> this one's from Jeremiah. Buy stock in tissue paper. Hashtag Kleenex. And here's the last one, I promise. This, this one might be funnier for you. The last one is from Mark. The look on Peter's face when he took two steps on the water and started to sink. Hashtag priceless. And so, you know, I was thinking about this whole idea of communication, and it seems as we um, have evolved over time in regards to our relationships and how we connect with one another, that we have gone from periods of time of just picking up the phone and calling somebody, you know, to writing a letter to somebody, to sending emails, to sending text messages, to getting on Facebook and Twitter and all the other different social media accounts. And really, social media has just taken the whole, uh, our whole society, not just us, but the whole world by storm. And things have changed so much in regards to uh, communication and how we talk to one another. And, and so some of the things I want us to really think about as we're, as we're looking at this idea of communication is the fact that communication is inherently necessary, isn't it? I mean, it, it's important. It's important for us to have healthy communication. It's important for us to be able to open up and talk and be able to communicate with one another. In fact, we serve a God who is a God who communicates. I mean, that is what he does. He sends us, prophets and teachers and apostles, over, over time to communicate his message, his wisdom uh, to the world. So we serve a God who is a God of communication. And he desires us to even communicate with him um, as we lift, lift up our voices in prayer and even in song um, as we communicate back to our God. So we serve a God who is a God of communication. But other parts of our life, if you really sit and focus on, on the things that are really important to us, things like relationships, the relationship between a husband and a wife, that, that communication is vital, isn't it? That communication, I mean, y'all are 50 plus years, right? And, you know, is communication valuable in your relationship? It is, isn't it? I mean, it is for all of us, right? And so we, we understand that communication is valuable and we need it. It's necessary. When you're talking about parent-child relationship, that communication is necessary. It's sometimes a little difficult, you know? I mean, you've got to kind of get down to the maturity level of a child. And, but that communication is necessary to have healthy relationships and be able to, to move forward as a family. Even in the church, the church needs good communication, we need to be open with things that are important, that's going to affect all of us, and we need to make sure that we do this kind of communication in a healthy way so that we are talking with one another and we're building those relationships and we're growing together and we're, we're bearing one another's burdens. You know, there's, there's always these passages in Scripture that kind of catch you off guard, you know, talking about uh, confessing our sins to one another. And Boy, that's, those things are tough, aren't they? Those ideas are tough. Those concepts are tough. It's hard for us to open up to other people. But the idea is that God is a God of communication. And he wants our, his people to be people of communication. So our question this morning, as we, as we continue on, is when does a necessary thing like communication become an evil thing? When, when, does that, when does the worm turn, so to speak? When does that transition take place? When does something so good and so necessary become something so evil uh, in our life today? 
And I think it's tempting. I don't know why it's tempting. I don't know where this comes from. I don't know what, what desire this, this brings up within us. But it's tempting at times to talk down or tear somebody down in order to build ourselves up. I mean, a lot of that comes with maturity, but the idea is that, you know, we see that in society, we see that in the world, that it's tempting. It's tempting to tear some, somebody else down in order to build ourselves up. Even if we don't think we're doing that, sometimes we do it. Sometimes we do it just not even thinking about it. We're just, uh, it's part of this sin, this desire that we have to slander. And the Bible warns us about that kind of stuff. It's tempting to whisper. It's tempting to whisper about somebody else behind their back, isn't it? The Bible calls this gossip. That's the word that is trans it's only translated a few times in our New Testament, maybe four or five times in the Old Testament, and it simply means whisper. Now, whispering is not always bad, but when the intent of the whispering is for evil purposes, it's for selfish gain, it's for something, for tearing somebody down or, or speaking of personal matters, that someone has entrusted with you and you go to somebody else and you say, well, you wouldn't believe what this person told me. You know, it's, it's going against somebody's trust. It, it's this idea of, of saying things that you really shouldn't say, right? And we kind of understand what that means. And I was really thinking about it in, in terms of just everyday life. And it, isn't it so much more obvious when you watch it on TV? You, you know, they amplify it so much and you see it and you're like, man, that that scoundrel, I mean, that, that person is just gossiping and doing all kinds of damage. It's so obvious when you see it on movies and on TV, but when it's in our own life, it's not so obvious. We, we, we sometimes have a hard time identifying slander and gossip in our own life because we, we tend to have a hard time putting definitions on these words and putting application to these words. So as we continue on, I hope that we will be able to, to talk more about this and be able to see what the Bible really does say on this. Now, I found this quote, and I thought it was really good. I, I couldn't find the original source. I, sometimes I try to dig around, you know, and try to find the source, but this one was too good for, for us not to, not to look at. But it says, conflict arises from unmet needs and unmet expectations subject to poor communication. It, you just keep reading it and thinking about it. I mean, that's so true, isn't it? it? When we think about the needs of others, how do we know what another person needs? If, they, if there's no communication, if there's no relationship, and that's really the idea of communication is that there's a relationship there where you can talk, if there's no communication, how do we know your needs? How do we know the needs of the family? How do we know the needs of our spouse? How do we know the needs of our kids? If there's no, there's no good way to communicate information, then these unmet needs are going to cause, cause problems. And, and in regards to expectations, we don't know what everybody's expectations are, and that's, that's hard to find out, isn't it? I mean, we try to figure out, well, what are they expecting? What are they expecting? But understanding people's expectations goes a long way in building good, solid communication in relationships. And so we need to be careful. We need to talk. We need to communicate. But we need to do so in a very healthy way. In order to have healthy relationships, we need to know each other's needs. And, and we need to, to try at least to understand each other's expectations as to how things are going to play out. And it's required of us. We need these things. So let's talk about this. When does a necessary thing like communication become an evil thing? In James, James chapter 3. You already knew I was going here because, right, that, this is the passage, isn't it? This is where James just lays it down and the, the rubber hits the road and we, he really digs into this idea of unhealthy communication. So James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he starts off by saying, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. And so that's how he begins this, this lesson. Your translation may say master. It's, it's the idea of a teacher of the law. It's a teacher of the word of God. And so teachers, preachers, elders have this great responsibility, don't we? Just as prophets of old had these, this great responsibility to take that which God has delivered to them and to deliver that message to the people, to speak God's worth in truth and in, in love. And because of this position, people look to them for guidance. Now, preachers are not always perfect, right? I mean, I'm not perfect. But because of the position that I have accepted 
as a one who sits up here and stands up here every single uh, week and, and speaks to you God's word. I, I feel there is a weightiness upon all preachers to, to really know what the Bible says and to dig truth and to present that truth to the people because that's what I was called to do. And so there's this idea that we have this great responsibility and people look to us for for guidance in those areas. People share personal information with teachers and elders and, and the like. And so there's this idea that people feel comfortable sharing personal information, but what are they looking for? Are they just sharing their personal information just for the sake of sharing it, or is there more to that? There's more to it, right? And people want, they want some support. They want help. They need, they need guidance. They need somebody who is has devoted themselves to the study of the word to help them through difficult times. To be able to tell them, well, the Bible communicates this message to you about this situation. And that's what they're looking for. And because of that, it puts teachers and preachers and elders in a very unique situation. They are to guide people in truth. That's, that's, that's a hard calling, isn't it? It's, it's kind of tough when you think about it. To guide somebody in truth. But the very same person that is called to guide somebody in truth can also guide somebody into, into error. And so we got to be super careful. And that's why James is saying this. Not everybody is going to do this. Not everybody should do this. Not everybody's able to do that. And so you have to be willing to take on the great responsibility that comes along with that. These words can be uplifting right? From the preacher, from, from the elders, from the teachers. They can be uplifting. They can be encouraging. They can even be convicting at times. And that's the part we tend to get very uncomfortable with. We like when the teacher and the preacher says things that's very uplifting. It's very encouraging. And that's good. I think the Bible says that a lot. There are a lot of things in the Bible that's very encouraging, very uplifting. But there's a lot of things in the Bible that's very convicting, and we have to be willing to accept that as well. We have to be willing to listen to all that the Word of God says. But the way that that message is presented, it needs to be done in such a way that is, is loving, that is not condemning in the sense that it's so harsh that the person feels that they can never overcome the temptation or the sin, it needs to be done in such a way that the information is presented without adding your additional emotional charge into it. And we, that's hard, folks. I mean, preachers get emotional. We get charged up. Don't we? we get excited. But then also we, we also feel for the person's needs. And we, we recognize the damage that sin can do. And we, we want so bad just to tell everybody, just stop sinning, right? You know, it's, just quit, quit it. It's hurting you. It's hurting everybody else. Just stop. But even with that, we need to be able to communicate that message the way the Word of God communicates that message and in a way that is going to cause you to, to think and be convicted and to make the choice to change because nobody who is forced to change is ever going to stay changed. You ever, you ever think about that? When somebody is for, has forced you to change, how long does that normally last? You know, when the doctor says, hey, you know, your health's not good and, and you really need to watch what you eat and you have no choice, but wh what do you want to do when you get home? Do you want to say, well, yeah, I'm going to listen to my doctor. I'm not going to eat this stuff. And No, you want to you get the bacon out. You want to get the egg. I mean, you just want to eat that stuff because you're being told not to. And there's something about us that just kicks back. We have to be gentle with one another. We have to be patient with one another. We have to communicate in such a way that it benefits everybody involved. And James says that stricter judgment will fall on those who teach. They'll fall on those some, something that's obviously good. Teaching is good, isn't it? I mean, teaching the word of God is good. It is healthy. It is beneficial. It is what God wants us to do. But that very thing can become something evil and bad. And it can be damaging to the communicator, and it can be damaging to the listener. And so we have to be hypersensitive to these things. The next thing James says is, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now I think it's interesting that James includes himself in this, this idea of stumbling. And what he's saying is that everybody makes mistakes. Have you ever had one of those... Um, foot and mouth moments. You ever had one of those? We all have, right? I mean, we've, you know, we've, we've all been there. We've all done that. We've all had these moments where we just, I shouldn't have said that, you know, or I shouldn't have said it that way. 
Or, yeah, that was the right thing to say, but man, I could have done it at a different time. I could have been more wise with my words. I could have been more sensitive to the situation. We've all been there. We've all been there. And James is saying that, you know, we've all stumbled in many different ways, and we've all stumbled in this way as well. And he says, but, but if there's a person among you that, that is perfect, is mature, and he's never stumbled in this way, I mean, that, that's evidence of the person's character, isn't it? You know, but who among us has ever been there? Who among us has ever, can sit here and just say that I've never, I've never said anything that was just wrong, right? I mean, that, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? It's kind of haughty. We had to be very careful with the way we think. And James is including himself in this. And he, we, we have to be careful. And that word perfect, it doesn't mean uh, sinless. It doesn't mean perfection in the sense that there's no fault. It's just talking about maturity. It's just saying that this person who's going to be doing the talking needs to know what they're saying. They need to know who they're saying it to. They need to say it in the right way. And they need to be very hyper, hyper careful about, about the attitude that they have when saying it. And so there's this idea that, that words are important, teaching is important, be careful. <laughs> James is using strong language to help us see this. Then he says in verse 3, Now, if you put the, the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct the entire body as well. It says in verse 4, Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a, a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet boasts of great things. So James starts off by, by making this illustration that the tongue is kind of like a bit in a horse's mouth. And, and the rider can, can direct that, that large animal, right? I mean, have you ever tried to push a horse? You ever try to do that? We, we used to have a horse growing up, and we'd try to get him out of the chicken pen where we kept our feed, you know, and, and man, you, there's no way you're pushing that thing, you know, but when you have a bit in a horse's mouth, and you can just pull those reins, and that horse, no, there's something about that that controls that horse, and so it's a matter of control, isn't it? What's controlling you? What's controlling you? And then you look at this ship, this giant ship, and you look at the rudder, and it's so small, and you're thinking, how could this ship ever move with this rudder? I mean, it doesn't make sense, but that's how it works. The small movement of the rudder will cause great movement of, of the ship. And, and so something so small, that's James's point, can control you. Your whole body, your whole life, everything about you, your relationships, your, your whole future can be influenced by such a small little thing, such as your tongue. And so be careful. Be careful how you use it. The same thing that we are able to use to communicate God's word, to express our love for one another, to, to give praise and encouragement, these thing, this very thing can also become an evil thing. It can also become a damaging thing. The very thing that we're able to go out into the world and to preach the gospel with, to, to preach the, the, the soul-saving message of Jesus, we're able to do that with our tongue. Isn't that great? Isn't it great we're able to do that? But that same thing is also able to, to destroy other people, tear them down, and even damage ourselves in the process. James continues on. He says, See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. Uh, the very world of iniquity, the tongue, is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set by fire by hell. Now, it's very strong language. James is, doesn't hold any punches when he's talking about this topic, but thoughtless words, thoughtless words can be the spark that Satan can use to just light an uncontrollable fire, right? Just, just words that are spoken out of anger, words that are spoken out of jealousy, words that are spoken out of malice, words that are spoken without thinking can be the very thing that Satan is looking for to light this uh, incredible fire. It doesn't take much, right? It only takes a spark, and the whole force can be ablaze. It only takes a few words, and everything in your life can go sour. Verse 7, 
He says, for every species of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. Now, this seems to be a reference to Genesis, talking about God giving dominion over, over all the animals to Adam. And he's saying that, you know, this is, this is how it was. This is how God has done this. And, and man is set in a position in, in creation where he has dominion over all of these things or ought to have dominion over all of these things. Go back and read Psalm 8 and Hebrews chapter 2 if you want some clarification on that. But the idea is that all these things have been tamed. But then verse 8, he says, but no one can tame the tongue. <laughs> I mean, you could tame a horse. If you could tame all these animals, but you can't tame the little thing that's in your mouth that's with you all the time. There's something about that that James is communicating to us. You can't tame that. It's restless, he says. It's evil and it's full of deadly poison. This, this idea of the tongue, we, we, can, we can hold our tongue for the next 10 years, right? I mean, we, can, we can be careful with what we say. We can be gentle and sensitive and thoughtful. And, and all this time we're thinking, don't say that, don't say that, don't do that. And, and then all of a sudden, after all this time of restraint and one slip of the lip, and we can do so much damage, so much damage by just saying the thing that we weren't supposed to say, by being immature with the words that we use. The tongue is restless, our speech, folks, needs to always be seasoned with salt, Paul says. It needs to be seasoned with salt. It needs to be savory. It needs to be thoughtful. Our thoughts need to be pure. Our attention's always good. And this is Paul. This is the very Paul that had to confront Peter with his hypocrisy. Isn't that interesting? And we think about Jesus and the things that he had to say about the Pharisees. I mean, there's a time and a place where things need to be said. But that takes a tremendous amount of of control and maturity. Folks, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. In fact, I've always kind of thought that if you feel like you're free to say whatever because you're mature, you're probably not mature. I think that's a good rule of thumb. If you really think that you're mature enough to say the right thing, you're probably not. We just need to be hypersensitive with what we say and what we do. Look at verse nine. He says, with it, with it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Once again, another Genesis reference. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. He says, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. So he's saying from the very same mouth that we can use to preach the gospel, to preach the word, to encourage people, to uplift people, even to, con to uh, um, admonish somebody, to warn somebody. Oh, these, this the same mouth, the same tongue that's able to do all of these good things for the benefit of the people and benefit of the kingdom. He says that, you know, this same tongue can also become something that is unsavory, right? From something that promises life, like a fountain, we, we find bitter water, right? We find bitter water. You know, we go to it, we think, yes, you know, finally after, you know, tromping through the desert, we know what that feels like. You know, all that time, but we find this fountain where we're dying of thirst, and we've got to drink from it, and guess what? We can't. We can't. It's another reference, isn't it, to the Old Testament, this idea of Israel passing through the wilderness, and, and they find water, and guess what? It's, it's bitter. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying that this, this is not supposed to be this way. You can't have the same thing coming out of that source. You're not going to expect fresh water from something that's producing bitter water. It shouldn't be this way. In verse 11, he says, Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh water. See, these, these things are obviously an impossibility. I mean, that's, I think that's kind of obvious. James is just really emphasizing the point here. But these are obviously an impossibility. But have you ever said to somebody or heard somebody say, you know, do you, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? You ever heard that before? You probably said that before. But, you know, we understand what that means, right? You know, somebody is, is speaking things that are probably not very clean, and, and you look at it and you think, you know, that. Your, what would your mom think if, you, if she heard you say that? You know, and James, in essence, is saying, do, do you praise your God with that mouth? 
right? I mean, you're out there slandering people, you're gossiping, and you're tearing people down, and you're saying evil things, and you're spreading rumors and gossip, and, and you're doing all this stuff with your tongue, and then you turn around and you use the same mouth to praise your God. He's just from a fountain. You're either going to get fresh water or you're going to get bitter water. You're not going to get both. You're not going to go to the ocean and expect to get fresh water out of the sea. It just doesn't work that way. James says these things are not, are not possible. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus says in verse 11, It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. And then he says on the Sermon on the Plain, Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasures, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Now let's continue with James. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds and gentleness of wisdom. So when, when, we, when we want the wise and understanding, right? We, we want people who are mature. We want people who are wise. We want people who, um, who exhibit these characteristics of being able to, to hold their tongue, right? To be able to, to control their life. And, and so we're looking for that, aren't we? We look for that with leaders, don't we? We look for people like that for, for guidance and direction in the church. We we. We look for that, but there's obviously something to look for, isn't there? there? There's something to look at. When you look at the person, you can say, you know, uh, I've listened to that person. I, I've been around that person. I've seen that person's life. I, I see the kind of fruit that they produce. That's, that's another analogy that comes up in the Gospels. This idea that what's in the heart, right? God only knows the heart. Isn't that true? But also, we can know a person's heart by things that are coming out of their mouth and by the life that they're living. There's evidence, right? You know, and, and Jesus is saying in, in those passages, and James is talking about this as well, that, that this wisdom, this, this wisdom, the person who is wise among you, is not going to be the person who is wise because they say they're wise. They're not going to be the kind of person who's wise because they, they have shown other people that they're wise. Right? They've convinced other Pharisees were so good at that. But it's going to be the kind of person who exhibits wisdom from, from above. God's wisdom. And you can hear it because you know what it sounds like because you've been looking at it, right? So you've got an idea of what that looks like. You, you know. You know, when we lived in Maryland for a while, the, there would be folks who would come up, you know, and, and we had people from all over the world. And they would come to our shop and, and do business with us. And, and sometimes they would bring in a translator. And, and I remember one time I was talking to this lady and um, they were, their kids were in a band and we were trying to get them set up for, for school. And, and she just paused for a second as we were visiting and she said, are you from Texas? And I said, yeah, I am from Texas. And she just started crying. I mean, it was just emotional. Her, her husband had been transferred there, and, and they were kind of stuck in an in odd situation. You know, her husband was special forces, and they, she didn't know where he was and what he was doing. It was all very secretive. And, and, and here she was with these kids, and she's trying to figure out how to navigate. I mean, being a Texan in Maryland is tough, folks. I'm just going to tell you. But, uh, you know, but, you know that, that idea that she could hear from the way I was talking I know where you're from, right? I, I know you. She doesn't know me, of course, but you know somebody. And that's kind of the way it is. When we're so familiar with God and so familiar with his family and so familiar with his word, we can hear his words coming out of somebody else's mouth. And we know that, that's the life-giving spring that I've been looking for, right? That's the water that brings life. That's, that's the word that I know is true because I know where it comes from. That's wisdom from above, folks. And that's what we're looking for. We look for that kind of maturity. We know people who are mature because we can hear what they say and we can see what they do. Verse 14. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, he says, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. He says, but this, was, this wisdom is earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. For where 
jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So back to our, our question, when does a good thing like teaching and preaching and communication become a bad thing? Well, according to James, it's when those words are spoken out of jealousy. It's when those words are spoken out of selfish ambition. It's, it's when we have something to prove and something to say to benefit ourselves. When we're looking out for number one, right? And not for each other. When, when we're saying things and not thinking about what we say, when we're saying things in such a way that we are hurting others and not helping them from the same fountain. Isn't that crazy? But that's the way James wants us to see this. He wants us to understand, but from the same mouth, good things can come and bad things can come. But it all revolves around what's truly in the person's heart. It's what's on the inside. It's what, what we, we've done in our life to cultivate and be transformed by the message of the Spirit as we have studied and learned and we have tried to model our life after the wisdom that comes from above. Folks, we need healthy communication. We need it. We need it. That it's, it's life-giving. We need healthy communication. We need re meaningful relationships. And that's what that all revolves around, doesn't it? We need meaningful relationships. And we need a healthy church. And that all revolves around having good hearts and being able to communicate to one another, being able to communicate God's word, being able to do so with patience and with love and with kindness, but with a whole lot of concern for each other's souls. We need to be careful. We need to be praying, folks. Truly, think about this. We need to be praying for God's wisdom. Not my wisdom, because I tell you, it's not very wise. It sounds wise to me. I mean, you know, when I say things, I think, man, that was, that was smart. That was wise. I mean, but God's wisdom, that's what we need, isn't it? We need to, to let go of ourselves and, and really focus on what God is saying. We need to learn what really controls us. If something so small as the tongue can control our entire life, that should be a warning to us about other things, right? We need to be careful. We need the wisdom from above. We need to be praying for that wisdom to guide us in everything that we do and everything that we say and everything that we continue to do. We need to look for God's wisdom. Verse 17, James says, the wisdom from above is first pure. It's, then it's peaceable. It's gentle. It's reasonable. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's, it's unwavering. It's without hypocrisy. That's what we need, isn't it? And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's be peacemakers. Let's be peacemakers by choosing our words wisely. If there's anybody here this, this morning speaking of words, this is the part of our service that we often give this invitation about, about making some changes, right? And, and so we, we look to you and we look to God and we ask, look at yourselves, is there anybody here that needs to put on Jesus in baptism, who needs to be baptized for the remission of their sins and to begin this journey with God, with Christ? Or is there anybody here among you who just needs the prayers of the congregation for encouragement? Because we can do that, right? We can use our tongue for that. We can pray to our God together and for encouragement and for strength. And if there's anybody in this congregation who needs that, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Bring Christ your broken life, so marred by sin. He will create anew, make whole again. Your empty, wasted years, He will restore. And your iniquities, remember no more. Who at the door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me, if thou wilt heed my call. I will abide with thee. Amen. 
Please be seated. Last week, Joel and I made the announcement that we were seeking and we had a man, a godly man, that expressed a desire to serve as an elder to this congregation. And we want to welcome Joe Barra is a member of the eldership of this congregation. One of the first things I told Joe when he came was that he was a prayer answered because it was with very humble heart that he told us that he wanted to serve as a leader in this congregation. He said at first he thought maybe he needed more time. But when he had prayed about it and thought about it, he said, I want to step up. I think God has a purpose in my life. And I think so too. Joe, I told you that I wanted us as leaders of this congregation to be more accessible to the congregation because I said I want communication but it needs to be a two-way street. Not only do we need to communicate with each and every brother and sister here, but we need feedback from you. We need to know your concerns. We need to know your desires. There may be a subject that you would like to, to hear sermons on. We need feedback both ways. But first of all, one of the greatest qualifications was a desire to serve. You know, when you take on this mantle of responsibility, you are judged more severely because we are the leaders of this flock. And we are responsible to direct this flock as best as we can humanly do with God's help towards our heavenly home. I found in Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter 3, and I want to direct this to Joe, but it's also for the eldership because it applies to each and every one of us. And in Ephesians 3, 14, it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your innermost being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Joe, I look forward to working with you, uh, Joel and I both look forward. There's going to be times it's going to be rewarding. And then there will be times that we have to stand steadfast in the truth. And together, we will shoulder this responsibility. Decisions won't be knee-jerk. They will be discussed, thought about, prayed over. And we ask this congregation for prayers, for knowledge and strength and courage that we may lead this flock home. Because that is our goal, is to get each and every one of us to heaven. There will be times that it's going to be difficult, and that's when we need your prayers the most. So, Joe, I look forward to serving with you and know that I'm here for any and every reason. Joe and I have already established a relationship of communication and to me, that's one of the first things that's important is we've got to be able to talk about the concerns of this congregation. We ask you to remember us in your prayers. Joe, do you want to say anything? There's really not much to say other than um, it's a really humbling thing to stand before you in this kind of a position. Uh, consider it an incredible honor, but at the same time, I'm real nervous about it. And um, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, God has really blessed our family by bringing us to Monahan's. We're blessed anyway, but I want you to know how much we love this congregation. We really do. And um, I just want to thank Joel and Ron for uh, their help in my making this decision. My wife, who, as you know, is my better half. And um, just pray for us, and let's uh, work together to make sure we all get to heaven and, then the, and we bring as many people with us as we can. I have an announcement to make also, uh, other than I'm very glad. Of, you know what it feels like to get a, one of the best Christmas presents you all want? Says so Joe that he, he decided to be an elder. I was so happy about, about that. Uh, some of you all know already I have bought a home in Austin, and uh, we want to be near our children, but we're, uh, Irma and I are deciding to just spend half our time there and half our time here. So we're going to be back and forth. So it's about 50 50. But with that said, uh, it's not right for me to remain as an elder half, you know, 50% of the time. It's not, it's not right. So I will uh, resign as elder effective at the end of this month. But I want to be able to speak with uh, Joe and Ron. And we're going to go over the things of the, uh, the important things of this church we need to go over with. The church history, all kinds of things we need to go over with. But that's what's going to happen with me. But I'll be, I will be back just like this. Half and half, so I won't be completely gone. And then next Sunday, we're going to make an, another announcement, but it'll be good. And, uh, but I, I don't want to say it yet, so it'll be next Sunday. It'll be a good announcement. I know what it is, but I can't tell you. All right. <laughs> All right. 
And you're right about it. And people know what they, your accent, wherever you go, they know where you're from. In Seattle, they called me a redneck. And in New York, a guy from uh, Australia said, you must be from Texas. That's what he told me. So all the way from Australia, they know it. Let's stand for the last uh, song this morning. Let's sing, My Eyes Are Dry. My eyes are dry, my faith is whole, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Our Heavenly Father, we want to come to you in prayer one more time as we close out this service and again give you thanks for all of the things you have blessed us with. We ask that you will give us the wisdom to use all of those blessings in your cause. Please be with us throughout this week and give us your guidance and your support and your love. We know we live in troubled times and we pray for everyone in this country and we pray for our leaders and our law enforcement people who are going through very troubled and stressful times and issues. Please be with all of those of our group who are ill and who've lost loved ones. They need your support and your love. We ask that you be with the leaders of this congregation and we pray that you will give a special measure to Joe as he takes on this new responsibility. And we pray that every one of us will give him the encouragement and do everything we can to help him. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.